like to welcome everyone to this month's uh, webinar, uh, the NDSU Extension Agribusiness Agricultural Market Situation Outlook webinar series. Uh, my name is Dave Ripplinger, uh, Economic Specialist with NDSU Extension and the moderator of the event most months. Um, we have kind of the standard docket, so a series of presentations. Uh, Brian Parman does have to leave, so if you have questions for him, you're welcome to ask uh, before he does so or to follow up later. Uh, if, but if you have other questions, if you could save those towards the end, you can ask using the Q&A tool or the chat tool at any time you like. Uh, but with that, I'll go ahead and hand it over to, to Brian. All right. Thanks, Dave. I'm going to get my screen sharing going so I don't forget like I always seem to do. Um, so I want to talk real quick about machinery and the equipment uh, situation and tell you everything I know, which shouldn't take long because I don't know a lot. And a lot of this information is 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 kind of challenging to go by. And I know I talk quite often about the macro economy, interest rates, uh, production costs and things like that. Recently, not a whole lot's changed between the last talk I gave on here, plus our ag lenders uh, conference. And there hasn't been any real new developments. So I just want to quit hit real quickly on a the equipment and machinery situation as it stands right now and a little bit of an outlook on that. So if you look here, here's here's the uh, St. Louis Fed. Uh, the, and when I'm talking about producer price index, this is more of an upstream um, metric for what equipment prices are doing. This isn't at the retail level. This is upstream of that. But it is a good indicator for if prices are increasing and, by, and how much, because, you know, typically if things are increasing upstream, it's going to come downstream and hit the consumer. But by and large, uh, new equipment prices have really been kind of moving sideways. I mean, ever since uh, the beginning of about 2023, toward the tail end of 2022 and into 2023, uh, you can see that the price index for uh, new equipment, new farm equipment, um, has uh, has basically just been trending uh, sideways. And the same thing for the most part for parts. Um, this would be uh, replacement parts uh, sold separately, obviously, but, but original replacement parts, those two have been moving sideways after, you know, that 2021 run up that we saw all the way into last, uh, late last fall. Um, again, just moving along uh, at a at a pretty modest um, increase overall. So digging into details, um, there's a, a some surveys that are out, and a, a lot of that information is is either copyrighted or proprietary, so I can't take charts from it or anything like that and put them up here. But uh, the dealers, according to a lot of the surveys, not as optimistic about their revenues on new equipment in 2024 uh, as they were a year ago. Uh, heading into uh, 2023, and basically 40, and according to some of the surveys that that went out this at once it was compiled, 48% of dealers expect declining revenues from 23 uh, into next year, and about 33% expected to decline, with 31% uh, expecting uh, or 33% yeah decline, and 31% of dealers expected growth in revenues from 23 to 24, and then about 21% of dealers expect no change. So you got essentially 48% expecting a decline in revenues, 31% expecting growth. So you would take this combined, uh, um, the vast majority, almost 70% expecting either decline or no growth at all, which is a change from last year when, when there was more growth expected uh, in the new equipment market. What that kind of says there in a nutshell is, you know, dealers aren't, aren't optimistic they're going to be moving a lot of the, these products. Uh, and and if that's the case, then you're probably not going to see a lot of upward pressure moving forward on those new equipment prices. Now they're not going to decline; they never do. Uh, but you but you probably won't see a big increase, or it's not expected into the next year, especially not due to some high demand. Now used equipment prices prices had uh, dealers are a bit more optimistic on those, and and. I'm going to show a slide here in a minute that kind of talks about the softening of used equipment prices. So I thought, well, if they're thinking prices are going to go down, you know, why might there be more optimistic on revenues? And then, of course, you know, obviously, if used equipment prices are falling, then it may be easier to move them. And maybe they make a little bit less in a percentage of the sale, but they're able to make more sales if, if there is a softening market on that. So they're probably 
the optimism is probably coming off of being able to make up for it in volume. So additional revenues for these dealers in volume of used equipment moving and not necessarily as much on the increase in prices. But I guess that that kind of remains to be seen uh, where that's heading. So used equipment inventories, and this is from a separate source, the Sandhills Global, uh, who puts out these reports um, periodically on what farm equipment's doing, and they're out of uh, Nebraska. That they used, and this just came out recently, used a, a over a, over 300 horsepower tractor inventories are almost double what they were a year ago on the used equipment market. Um, and then the other thing that's going on is the spread between asking prices. So people who who haven't asked whether they're selling privately or or asking prices by the seller, uh, that spread is growing be, uh, between what's they're actually being sold for, which indicates a downward uh, downward pressure then on the actual equipment that's sold versus asking price. So you've got a sellers right now who kind of were looking at last year's numbers and expecting at least to hold. On, on used equipment prices or even an increase. And that's just not what buyers are willing to pay right now. Those auction prices are actually declining. So there is a definite softening that's occurred, uh, especially on the large, uh, large tractors and large equipment. And some dealers are reporting slow inventory movement. And it's been suggested that to move some of these higher priced items, they're even going to have to potentially offer some sort of financing deals. That's what's been suggested in order to move some of this, indicating that the, that the, the demand there for that used equipment just isn't overly strong, or at least not at the prices being offered. And then smaller equipment inventories are following a similar trend. Auction values for 100 horsepower, essentially to 300. They're up less than 1% compared to a year ago, and inventories on that are up 36, 37% right now. Again, showing those used inventories are increasing. Uh, which would lead you to believe that then you're going to see a softening in the overall price. As inventories move, dealers are going to want to drop the prices to go ahead and move that stuff out the door. And then probably you're going to see uh, less being offered on trade-in values on any used equipment coming on coming onto the dealer's lots. Compact tractors, the same thing. And then combine auction values have also been driving values lower. Uh, combine auction values on combines have been driving lower this fall as well, uh, at least uh, regionally, uh, according to the data set, which is then driving overall farm equipment values down to um, on average. And so that's kind of the situation at, as it stands right now is that we're, we're essentially seeing a hold even on new equipment prices so far this year. Um, as we're getting toward the end of uh, end of 2023, and there are definitely some some soft, softer indicators or data that's suggesting a softening in the used equipment market considerably. Um, and it'll remain to be seen how far that goes as, as things settle, as that gap in uh, auction values versus what's being asked continues to grow. You know, something has to give. And the longer it stays and persists, the more likely it is that the sellers are going to have to wind up accepting lower lower prices or lower values for those trades or used equipment uh, moving forward. So with that, uh, like I said, you know, information on used equipment and new equipment is often tough to come by, mostly on the newer equipment side. It, essentially, you got to trade uh, or, or listen to auction values and kind of look at it uh, sort of an autopsy at the end. But uh, as I said, I have to, uh, Dave said, I have to jump off. Um, I can't stay on till the end. So I, I'll tr if there's any questions real quick, I'll, I'll try to answer it. Uh, otherwise, um, you can email me, um, brian.parman at ndsu.edu or just Google me there. So if there's any questions, uh, our next speaker will be Frain, Dr. Olson. <laughs> and I'll just wait for a second to uh, see if anyone has a question to ask. Yeah, we'll give you just a minute here if you need to. Uh, yeah, just a, again, you know, a few minutes in case somebody wants to post something in the chat or just go ahead and uh, ask on the Q&A either way. But again, like I said, uh, it's getting a gauge on the used equipment market is tough. And, and because you can have auctions where you wind up seeing some stuff sell for higher prices and then a couple of weeks later, 
uh, you see much lower prices sold. So then you ask, are prices increasing or are they decreasing? And the truth is, we don't know. You need to get enough data and enough of these auctions because i'm I'm sure i can probably find somebody listening now who heard about an auction where stuff was selling way above what people thought it would and then i'll get another comment well they were having a hard time moving it some of them didn't even meet reserve prices or anything like that so um that's why it's a really tough uh area of production cost uh to track um for us or anyone else who's who's looking at these things well, I don't see any questions um, coming in yet, Brian. So, all right, it's okay with everybody. I will share my screen and thank you very much. You got it. Have a good one. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Frank Olson. I'm the crop economist, marketing specialist with NDSU Extension. Um, here's my contact information. So, if there is some questions or things you you want to talk about or visit about later on, I'd be happy to do that. Um, so, I'm going to go through. A, a, a bit of a, an overview of the information we got uh, earlier today from the November WASDI, the World Agricultural Supply Demand Estimates, as well as an update in the production report. So before I uh, get my, there we go. Um, so a, a few key thing market issues that I just want to want to visit about. Um, first off, and we'll go through this in more detail. Um, the WASDI reports or USDA reports came out negative for soybeans, corn, and wheat. Um, I wouldn't call them dramatically negative, but I, they they definitely put kind of a negative tone back into the marketplace. Uh, a couple things to point out. I did mention this last month, and I wanted to give you some specific numbers. Uh, the U.S. corn exports are off to a pretty good start this year uh, relative to last year, uh, but soybean and wheat pr- uh, export pace is much slower. So the the numbers that you see in the little table below actually came out this morning. So these are export sales as of uh, 11-2, so about a, you know, about a week ago. It takes, takes a while to compile everything and put out the reports. Um, so these would be sales. Uh, these, are, these are actual from the beginning of the marketing year. So this would be for the delivery and marketing year 2023. So starting on, on September 1, running through uh, this, this date of, of first couple of days here in November. So if we look at the far right-hand column, that's the accumulated sales uh, for this marketing year relative to last marketing year. So the first row is for corn. And as you can see, the corn exports, uh, the export sales, I want to be very careful. Now this is export sales. These are not actual deliveries yet. Are ahead of last year's pace. Uh, soybeans are behind. And, one of the, and last year was an okay soybean year for exports, uh, but our pace is much slower this year. We got kind of a slow start, kind of a late start mainly because the Brazilian crop was very, very large this last year. So they had more, more soybeans to be able to export at a, at a cheaper price. And so not only China, but also other major buyers are buying from Brazil. And that now is starting to taper off. Um, there was an additional announcement this morning of about a, a little over a million metric ton sale of U.S. soybeans to China. Now, those numbers are not reflected in the numbers you see right here, uh, but China is coming in. And for the last a oh, week or so has had some really good export uh, purchases from the United States. So it is starting to pick up. Um, the question, of course, is how long will that pace last? Um, the, la- the, the next row below that would be for all wheat, and this is all wheat classes blended together. Um, last year was not a good export season for the U.S. wheat uh, um, industry. Um, this year, we're off to a little slower start than we were last year. Now, on a sidebar, I do want to point out at the very bottom row is for spring wheat only. Notice that the spring wheat export pace is a little bit ahead of where we were this time last year, which is which is kind of comforting. Uh, but yet, wheat prices are still kind of in the doldrums right now. They're having a really hard time. So, U.S. wheat, even though there's there's tightening to, uh, supplies in the global wheat market, um, n- n- that really hasn't translated into U.S. export sales. Um, I am going to talk a bit more in, towards the end of this, my session, talking about the Brazilian uh, production, uh, where are we sitting with soil moistures and weather, et cetera. But I do want to just remind everybody that the forecast for Brazilian so- so- soybean and corn um, are, are, are very strong, uh, in particular for soybeans. So if we look at f- from Conab, which is the kind of the the Brazilian version of USDA. They do things a little differently in Brazil, but it'd be similar to their version of USDA. Um, They're looking at uh, increased plantings by about two to 3%. 
uh, about 11.2 million acres, 45.3 million hectares. Uh, just as a reference point, the United States last year, this 2023 production season, the one that we're harvesting right now, we planted about 83 million acres in the U.S. So their planted area is much, much larger than ours. Um, their average yields, uh, trend line yields are very similar to the United States. So, you know, they got a really big production engine for soybeans. Now, if you do the math on that and calculate everything out, based on Conab's estimates, the soybean production, how many tons or bushels of soybeans are the, are the Brazilians going to produce is at 162 million tons. Now, that is well above last year's record of 154, 155 million metric tons. So put that in perspective, this year, given the updated information we got today, the U.S. is forecasted to produce about 112 million metric tons. So again, when we think about the size of the production capacity coming out of Brazil, in particular for soybeans, um, they're looking at an additional record crop well above what they had this last year, assuming now that the weather holds up, which we're going to talk about in a minute. In contrast, they are looking at a, the current forecast as a slight reduction in corn production. Again, this would be tons produced, about 119, almost 120 million metric tons uh, this upcoming year, the crop that they're going to be planting now in, in a few months, uh, versus last year at about 132 million metric tons. Um, and again, now put this in perspective, the United States produces about 386, 387 million metric tons. So we're a much larger producer of corn than Brazil. But Brazil actually is forecast to have a stronger export season. So they're actually going to export more the, the corn than the United States in the upcoming year based on the USDA estimates currently. So they don't produce as much, but they don't use as much domestically either. And then finally, as another kind of reference point, Stonex, which is one of the, the large international forecasting firms, their best guess right now for Brazilian soybean production is 165 million metric ton, which again is towards the high end of the range of private estimates. But, you know, I'm just trying to give you a feel that if everything goes well in Brazil, and that's a big if, th they could produce uh, an exceptionally large crop one more time uh, in, over and above what they had this last year, which of course is going to put some downward pressure on soybean prices longer term. Now, short term, that's not the case. We still have a lot of growing season left. So let's dive into the reports we got today. Um, so let's talk first with the production estimates. Uh, we did an, a, an update for both US corn and US soybean production numbers, not only yield per acre, but also then total bushels produced. Um, as usual, the blue line on top is what the average trade estimate was. So these are the numbers that the traders and, and, and market analysts were expecting to see. Um, towards the bottom, the highlighted black line is the numbers we had from last month. And the numbers in the red at the very bottom is when we got the, the numbers we got a couple hours ago. So the key differences, obviously, the corn yield estimate went up. Uh, it, you know, most trade analysts were looking at something very similar to what we saw in October. USDA did increase corn yields, and that was pretty much across the board. There was a, uh, not only the Corn Belt states of Iowa, Illinois, and Indiana, but they also increased North Dakota, Minnesota, and even parts of, of Nebraska corn yields. So they, they, they just took kind of the whole corn complex and moved it up just a smidge. Now, I'm not sure exactly what caused that. Um, it could be a better estimate for test weights. Uh, of course, we'll have to wait to see once the final numbers come out. For soybeans, uh, the soybean numbers, the US, the private analysts were looking for basically flat or hold even. We did get a slight uptick in, in um, yield per acre for soybeans, but very small, relatively small. So if you translate again, higher yields times the same uh, harvested acreage, we end up with slightly increased production. So what does that mean for our bottom line? Because obviously if you have higher production, there is some partial offset when it comes to consumption. Um, again, blue line on top is what the trade was expecting. The black line that's highlighted is what we got last month. And the red line on the bottom is what we got uh, a couple hours ago. So let's compare the blue line and the red line. For wheat, all wheat, the number went up. Um, and, and that was actually a little bit of a surprise. I think most of the private analysts were expecting kind of a hold even. The, the only major change there was a, some minor adjustments or small adjustments in the imports of wheat. And when I looked at it by class, there was a slight increase in, in projected imports 
for both hard red spring wheat as well as hard red winter wheat, there was a reduction in Durham and a slight increase in soft red winter wheat. So by the time you balance all those things out, the increase in the bottom line is really directly from an increase in, in the projections for wheat imports into the United States. And some of that is a logistical issue. I really don't have time to go into it right now, but if you do have some questions, I'd be happy to, to try and answer those later. On the corn side, of course, that was probably the biggest change or adjustment we saw was in the corn numbers. Because of the higher yields, we did increase the production, but then to partially compensate for that, they increased, USDA did increase the consumption or the usage for all the major categories. So the feed number went up, the uh, exports number went up, and the um, ethanol number went up. So there's some partial offset there between increased production and potential increased consumption. Obviously, the net was also an increase in our bottom line. For soybeans, kind of the same thing. There was an increase in production numbers, but USDA did not make any adjustments in the consumption estimates. So that increase, the change from last month to this month was all due to be because of the uh, increased yield forecasts. So I wanna provide a little bit of an update on a couple items that we talked about last month. Uh, just to give you an idea, one of the things I did mention very quickly was that the Mississippi River levels, uh, in particular towards the Southern part or toward the lower Mississippi, have been very, very low. That was limiting barge traffic, increasing barge costs, the, the cost of barge shipping grain by barge, as well as the volume shipment. This is the water levels at, at Memphis, Tennessee um, last month. So this is the what I showed you last month. And this is this month's numbers. So let me, let me flip back. This is last month's. And that, gr that brownish area is what they call the low stage. So, you know, like in, in, in North Dakota, when we talk about flood stages as things go on the high side, they also have a low stage where below that level, um, the, the barge shipping is, is hindered or hampered. So last month, they were anywhere from 10 to 11 feet below that low stage. We did get back up to kind of that, that net minus five feet that, that is still allows full navigation. But the forecast is for that to come back down again. So that some of that surge or rebound in river levels was because of some rain that hit the Ohio River Valley and, and the central Mississippi uh, basin. So this is, this is still an ongoing issue. Um, I will, you'll likely hear some more comments or issues, talk about it as we move forward into the rest of this marketing year. Um, just to let you know, and to, to, to kind of explain what's going on, the, the black line right there is a three-year average of grain shipments. We're measuring that through the Lock 27, which is Granite City, Illinois. Kind of use that as a reference point for the movement of grain from the Corn Belt into the uh, Louisiana Gulf. So the black line is the three-year average, and then the bars represent weekly information on shipments this year, and they have it broken down by the type of grain. So the gold is soybeans, the blue is corn. You can see that we, we do have this strong seasonal pattern of when we see barge movements. Um, we did see kind of a, a, a higher level coming into last week. That is now backed off a little bit for this week. This is actually information that we, again, got this morning. So we do need to be paying attention to the barge shipping because that might impact where some of these grains are delivered, whether it goes to Louisiana Gulf or whether it goes to the uh, PNW out of, the, out of uh, the West Coast, which really has more of a draw from this region. So now let's talk about whether and kind of will Brazil and Argentina have the capacity to be able to make these large crops that they're ta actually talking about. So this is a map of soil percent soil moisture. So notice the scaling on the bottom. So this would be percent soil moisture. At, at what levels are we at right now relative to a 20-year average? And I tried to draw in with this black line kind of the major growing region. So it, the major growing region would be south and west of this line. So here's Mato Grosso right in the middle. You can see that the soil moisture levels in the, in the northern and in central part of Brazil are in the very dry side. Last year, they were, had a fantastic year. Part of the reason was because they had very good rainfall and very good soil moisture. It was the southern part that had the drought areas and that kind of took the top end off of their production. Well, this year it's exactly flipped. So if we look at southern Brazil, you know, they're in a much better shape for soil moisture conditions. They're almost to the point of being excessive. 
um, from a soil moisture standpoint or the water holding capacity of the soil. But when we get into these core growing regions for in particular soybeans, but also for corn, uh, the first crop corn, excuse me, second crop corn, um, a bit on the dry side. When we look at temperatures, and this is the average temperature last week. So please notice the dates on the very bottom. Um, these are in degrees of Celsius. So I converted uh, Celsius into Fahrenheit to give you a better idea of kind of the ranges. As you can see in Monte Grosso, most of that was between 30 and 35 degrees Celsius, which is anywhere from 80, about the mid 90s, that's about 90 ish degrees um, in Fahrenheit. So very warm. They're coming off of their summer. They're, um, excuse me, coming off of their winter, moving into the summer months now. And this is where most of the planting progress has been occurring, is in Mato Grosso, uh, 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 Mato, yeah, Mato Grosso, Mato Grosso de Sol. Uh, Goyos has been uh, very rapid planting progress, and a little bit slower as you move further south. So very warm conditions for this time of year. It's in the spring of the year for them. It's in the fall for us. When we look at rainfall, now this is the forecast moving forward. The one before was looking backwards at what have the temperatures been at. This is the forecast moving forward for precipitation. So this would be for the upcoming week. So the next seven days. And again, notice most of the, the central, uh, the, the, the northern and central growing regions, you know, let some light showers, some sporadic showers coming through. I've also converted from millimeters of rainfall into inches of rainfall to give you an idea. So 45 millimeters is about a little over an inch and a half, 1.75 inches. So this southern region, which already has quite a bit of, of good soil moisture, has been recharged pretty well, is also expected to see some additional rainfall. So again, when we think about weather in Brazil, it's a very large country. We have to make sure that we're listening very carefully when we talk about what areas are dry and what areas are wet. Moving into uh, Argentina. Um, Argentina, what I've tried to do again is circle the two major corn and soybean growing regions in Argentina. Now, last year, Argentina had a severe drought. In fact, that was the third consecutive year of, of drought conditions. So coming into their spring's work now, they, are, they still have the holdover from that, that um, they're very, very dry conditions. And I'll show you in just a minute, there really isn't for the next week or so any expectation that we're going to see a, additional rainfall to help out. And that's, that's impacting the wheat production because they have some winter wheat that's, being, uh, that's now starting to, to head and develop but it also have potentially an impact on their seeding for corn and soybeans. So these are the two major regions. And I wanna use this kind of little big bump out right here as the reference point for location. Um, so this is the core growing region for both corn and soybeans. Uh, notice that the, the drier soil conditions that they have, again, not quite as bad as parts of Brazil, but still very, very dry in that region. We get into temperatures. Uh, much more moderate because they're they're further south, they're further away from the equator, they're a little bit cooler. So most of their time, daytime temperatures have been in the 60s or the 70s. Again, very moderate. They are starting to make some of the planting progress, but it's a little bit slower than the, what they see in Brazil. Looking at rainfall, again, here's the tip of southern Brazil. That was that blue blob that we saw before in the Brazilian area. Um, so you look at these major growing regions of, of Argentina, they are expected to get some rainfall, some rain showers that, yes, it may slow up planting progress a little bit, but if it's very, very dry conditions, that additional rainfall should uh, at least boost people's, um, um, hopefully their kind of the farmer's attitudes and, and, and look a little bit more positively in what the, what the, um, the, the outlook might be as we move through the summer months. So a lot can happen yet. We're just in the planting progress. Uh, I noted in one of my previous slides that right now Brazil is a is not quite 50% planted. Just under 50% of their soybeans have been planted, versus last uh, last year at this time at about 57%. So last year was a very rapid planting progress. Um, this year is actually a bit more normal, a bit more typical. So the soybean crop in Brazil is about halfway planted. Again, very early in the crop development. Uh, we're going to have to wait to see and watch watch the weather conditions very closely. So with that, I will stop sharing my screen um, just to provide, provide uh, an update. Um, I'll try and answer the questions at the end of the session. So now I'll hand things over to Tim Petrie. Good afternoon, everybody. Tim Petrie, Handy Extension Livestock Marketing Economist. Today, I'm just going to go uh, 
Well, I'll go to this the second slide, and this is where we left off uh, the last slide uh, last uh, month, which was the uh, 12th of October. And I was just talking about what was available for LRP coverage for backgrounded cattle into March. And you see up there that we could get uh, 253 and uh, at a 626 premium. Hindsight now says, wow, that would have been a really, really uh, great thing to do uh, because the uh, the uh, futures closed today at, at uh, 227, I guess. So anyway... Uh, and if you go, but, but my talk really was, you know, if you didn't want to pay that high premium, you could come down and get a lower premium. Like, uh, here's the, uh, the, uh, budget that was on our website back then. And it has been updated now. We've lowered all the prices where they went and actually corn has went down. And so we have a new budget on there that's different and a new break even price and stuff, but the break even price there was, was 238. So I said, you could come down here and get one, you know, talk to producers should talk to their lenders or lenders should talk to their producers and, and see how much you want to pay for a premium, but you could get a, you know, instead of paying $50 at the top, you could bring that down to $18. And that would actually that lower, uh, 239.69 would be in the money now. Yesterday, the cash settlement price was 238. And today it's off another, just now came out, it's off another dollar to 237. But still, uh, you know, wouldn't quite cover the premium, but get but getting close. Over there, I say now the March feeder cattle was 235. That's what they were yesterday. But again, they're uh, down to uh to uh, 229 today down 555 so just a crash so want to go on then and talk about what's happening and these charts are actually based on yesterday and again they're they're going to be down and and what's happening is the cash market is behaving very normal like it usually does it's just the futures market is berserk now and uh, what happened was uh, we'll start off here with live cattle, the December live cattle on the top, and then we'll go to feeder cattle in a minute. You go back there to mid-September, you see the futures were up there at 191, and uh, the cash market was down there at 182 or something. So the futures was way above, and by December, they have to come together. So the futures market started ratcheting down to get closer to the cash market, which it did, uh, got down there closer by the end of October. But then it just kept going and did pick up a little bit. But now the last uh, few days, it's crashed down again and is way below the cash market. We had a 185 cash market last week, and now uh, the, you see the futures were down there at 179. And today they closed, we're down five bucks at 174. So they're way below the cash market. So what's happening is just the funds are risk off with cattle. They were long cattle for many, many months, as you see on that chart way back. And then when it started going down, it's just hitting their stops and going down. And, and, and so the cash market you see is, is, you know, relatively stable. The, the chart that I always show you is on the bottom there. We were, uh, our peak was back there at the uh, first week in June. We were there at 188.75, but we were 185 last week. So the cash market is, you know, stayed in there. It's the futures market that just uh, has went down. And the same thing on feeder cattle. And here's the, on the top is November feeder cattle futures. Back in mid-September, they were up there you know, almost 270 and the cash market was down at 252 or something. And so then the futures had to come down to meet the cash. And same thing happened with when the October feeder cattle closed. And uh, so then uh, down and the cash market has been going down. But as you will see in a minute, the cash market going down after mid-September is very normal. It, it always does. And so the cash market went down and the, the futures just followed now, except the last couple of days, then 
they the, uh, the they've really been bailing out a feeder cattle. So uh, yesterday there it was uh, two thirty four, I guess, and then the March futures today uh, are off seven seventy five at two twenty seven. So now they're way below, uh, you know, the cash market. But back to the normal that the that the cash market usually does go at this time, just go down to the bottom that we always look at. And, you know, we peaked there in September this year, and uh, that's usually a good time to look at price risk management for backgrounding cattle. But that usually happens. Go down, you know, last year, the blue line, it peaked there in September, a little bit earlier in 2020, one, but right around a little early in September, but it always peaks there. In fact, the the uh, ten year seasonal average here, uh, you know, back to two thirteen to twenty twenty two, you see that peak there. Uh, and and what a seasonal index is, you go across from one. That means prices. The red line is the average that they're you know five uh, percent higher than normal, and then they keep on going down into usually into March when all those uh, cattle hit the market. So the the cash market declining was very normal, and that happened and not abnormal. It's just been the futures, and on, on the bottom then. Uh, it's kind of interesting where we we take the 750 to eight pound steers and you know minus the fed steers and they usually do peak in uh, September the, the the spread because they're buying feeder cattle now but they're hedging them against the April live cattle futures that are out into the distance and uh, which, you know, are are usually at a seasonal peak themselves in terms of, of uh, fed cattle. But this year they were way higher. You see up there at $73 instead of uh, 43, about $30 higher. And then as those distant, that April live cattle futures started falling, they've, uh, you know, ratcheted down, not quite back to, to a normal situation, but uh, down further. So that's what's happening. The cash market is behaving very normal it's just the futures market were too high and now they're too low and the the funds are bailing out and they continue to do it today so uh we're put in a little plug here we're going to do a backgrounding seminar on november 28th so that'll be another chance for you to hear me and get an update in particular as it pertains to feeder cattle and again we may even have to update the budget again that's on the website the way you know is you can put your own numbers in there anyway on that website that i showed you at the beginning but we're gonna you know talk uh I'm going to talk and Parman's going to talk about uh, uh, several different budgets for, for feeder cattle, uh, heifers and steers and uh, lower weight gain and so on. And and uh, Carl Hoppy's going to be on with some different rations and uh, Zach Carlson talking about implants and Dr. Stuck about uh, calf health. So help yourself to that. There's the, the website. It'll be live 7 o'clock. Uh, on November 28th, but it'll also be recorded if you want to see that. Just end up Thanksgiving's coming up here. And again, last year, uh, turkey prices were record high and there was all this talk where there wouldn't be enough available. And I assured you then that there would be available, but yeah, it was at higher prices. And avian influenza was a big thing and avian influenza has hit again this year, but not affecting us near as much as it did last year. And we've got a lot of turkeys uh, on hand ready for Thanksgiving. And so the price you see has went back down to normal and uh, on on the, the whole birds on the top and on the bottom same thing on on uh, turkey breast so there will be good buys if you want to know why our my new our newsletter that came out in november here uh, uh explains all this and you can most of you i think get that uh you can just read that and you see wholesale turkey breasts were to 30 or something last week at the wholesale level we have a retail store in fargo last week that had a, a turkey breast for 169 so they're going to be uh cheaper turkey if you want turkey for thanksgiving or if you want other meat products there will be plenty of them too so with that i'll stop sharing and uh turn it over to ron i'm going to talk this afternoon good afternoon everybody uh, ron haugen um farm management specialist um, I, I'm going to talk about the new uh, emergency relief program. It's actually not that new. It's been announced, 
but the regulations are finally coming out and you can actually start applying for that. And I say that uh, you don't really have to do much to apply as well. So I'll get into that. I, I thought I understood this. And with every new program, there's always some confusing things that I qu don't quite understand, but but I'll try to uh, tell you the best I, I can about the program. First of all, the program was signed back in 2022 by President uh, Biden. Um, it's about $3.7 billion for uh, assistance to egg producers impacted by some kind of disaster. Uh, you, you could almost name any kind of disaster, and it's probably covered in this. Kind of a little overview. Um, this is called the Emergency Relief Program 2022. The other program we had was for 2020 and 2021. So this one is for 2022, just to keep that straight. The last program we had had phase one and phase two. Now they changed the name. They're calling it tracks. We have track one and track two, a two track pro uh, process. I've got a lot of words on this on my slides here, but you can uh, you can uh, uh, go and look at our recording, and and I won't go through everything word by word. But I wanted to have this out here in case you needed to to double check some 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 technical thing here. But anyway, just a quick uh, explanation. Track one: um, if you had crop insurance or NAP insurance, that's the initial basis for calculating the payments. Track two. Um, that's for anybody that slipped through the cracks and uh, and may not had had that insurance and just to try to cover everybody. First of all, eligibility. Uh, a lot of different crops uh, are are qualified for Track One. The only thing is they have to have crop insurance or NAP. Uh, not crops intended for grazing, however. These are the natural disasters that we that 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 are are covered. Does that, uh, wildfire, tornado, hurricanes, heat, winter storms. But one thing, one thing that is not covered is a hail loss. Uh, as, far as far as I can tell, um, hail is not covered. So how do you apply? You really don't have to do much. FSA is in the process of sending out applications that are already filled in because they know all of your crop insurance and NAP information. But just because you get an application in the mail doesn't mean you are qualified or doesn't mean their numbers are correct. You better check over those numbers and make sure you're qualified before you sign on the dotted line and send that back to them, okay? There is an online tool on uh, uh, the USDA has that you can actually put in some of your numbers and help you figure some of this stuff. Here's how things are calculated. Uh, for track one, they use your what you got for your insurance for 2022 for crop insurance losses or NAP losses. And here's something new. It's called a progressive payment. For those that do not have 75% of their income from farm, there's what they call a perfect progressive payment. And it's, it's trying to, I think the objective here was trying to to um, not to to um, weed out some of the people that are getting out farm payments that aren't really farmers, some big, some big, let's say, movie stars that own farmland are invested in farmland and get payments, and they they're already multimillionaires. So there's things like that, and that, that that's why they put in here. I'll show you the I'll show you the chart here in a little bit. Also, um, any under underserved producers. They get, a, they get a break on this. They get their share of premiums and fees added to their payment that they paid. And underserved producers are beginning farmers, veterans, and other socially disadvantaged. Here's the chart of that progressive factory, which I don't quite understand yet. I, I tried to study it more this morning and I got a little bit more confused. So it looks like if you got a payment over $2,000, that's fine. There's not really any any change. But if you get your payment over ten thousand, then you're going to be weeding it weeding it back. And so, just to keep that in mind, there is something a little different than the than the ERP program we had before. This is pretty much the same as ERP uh, for 2020, 
21 and 20, 20 and 21 phase one, basically it's, it's bumping up your coverage levels for the insurance that you had is what it's doing. And this table looks exactly the same as the previous program a, a couple years ago. Now, in track two, that's the second track, there's two options within the track two. Uh, the option one, people maybe are familiar with this one. This is similar to phase two of the, of the e e ERP. And this is where you need to provide your tax information for your gross revenue. And you need to take out certain things and add certain things. Uh, and then basically you just provide FSA with two, two numbers from the from the benchmark year and the and the disaster year okay the second is the the expected revenue option and those are for people that probably don't have the proper records or ha or another situation just to kind of so nobody slips through the cracks the expected revenue option so for the first option the tax year option uh basically you get your tax records and if you choose to be in, ta in track two, you select 2018 or 2019 as the benchmark revenue, uh, as the disaster year, and, and then you, the benchmark year, you select 2022 or actually 2023 as your representative year, okay? And you need to get your gross income from both of those years. On the expected revenue option, it allows you to certify your revenue uh, and what is what they call a reasonably expected revenue uh, absent any disaster conditions. A little more complicated to figure that out. So here's a chart just showing the track two options. You're, you're looking at 18 and 19, and then you're looking at 22 or 23 for the tax year. And I, I imagine most people would fall under the, the tax year option under track two. The expected revenue option you're, you're uh, a little more complicated. You're using the actual revenue from all eligible crops that were that, that are included. As I mentioned, underserved producers, limited resource, socially disadvantaged veterans, farmers and ranchers will re receive an additional 15% factor. Also, anyone that signs up for these programs, you are required to get crop insurance for the next two years or NAP insurance. One thing that was a little uh, a new additional information, producers who apply for track one then, you can also apply for track two, and it looks like you probably should apply for both, but their track one payment will be reduced from anything from track two. So there isn't any double dipping. So next, I'm gonna talk about the ELRP 2022, and that's the livestock part of it. Okay, and this is fairly simple, very simple. And this is to uh, to help people offset um, disasters that are that are that produce livestock. Okay, how to apply? There again, very simple. Very simple. Um, it's a streamlined delivery. Eligible producers, uh, you you not have to submit an application. The IRS has it all. I mean, the FSA has it already figured out for you. And here's how it's calculated. Um, they will. Uh, if you were in a disaster county in 2022 and it qualified for livestock forage L disaster program LFP, you you automatically get a percentage of that, and what you get is 90 percent of that for underserved and 75 percent for everybody else. But you're not going to get that right away. You may not get that because there's 500 million targeted for this. So they're only going to pay you 25% of your proposed payment at this point. And then you wait and see how many people apply and you, and you might get more of a payment later. So that's a pretty simple way. But the thing is, for North Dakota in 2022, there was actually only, let me see, one, two, three, four, five counties, I guess, that qualified for LFP. So the way I read it, the only people that are going to get any payments under that program are people that live in this county and 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 had an LFP payment. So th that's the that's the what I the way I understand that program at this point. So 
There are payment limitations. If you had a gross a adjusted gross farm income less than 75% of your average, then you're, you're limited to 125% for the specialty crops, the non-specialty, and the livestock. If your adjusted gross is more than 75% of the or average, then you're, you go up to nine, nine, 900,000 for the specialty and high-valued crops, vegetable-type crops, 250 for non-specialty, and 250 for livestock. Okay. So as always, look at farmers.gov, USDA.gov. They've got some good tools and good fact sheets that you can that you can uh, 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 find out about all the details. And as as always, contact your FSA office for for all the details. Uh, they can help you out a lot. So with that, I will wait till the end, and I will um, I will um, turn it over to David after this, and uh, he will continue on. Thank you. Great, thanks, Ron. Excuse me, I have some comments about the renewable diesel uh, situation as it continues to uh, impact biofuel markets and uh, U.S. agriculture. So a couple of things, some highlights uh, of what's going on. Uh, we may not have felt this much in North Dakota, but there has been a significant decline in truck freight uh, this summer, especially, but for last year or so. There's some expectation that may be ending. There's like, a very strong relationship between uh, freight movement and diesel use, as that's the primary fuel for for freight in the United States, both for uh, for trucks as well as for rail. Uh, not a big surprise, but the renewable diesel market is continuing to grow. Uh, we still don't know how big it's going to get in terms of market share uh, on the West Coast, those states with the low carbon fuel standard. Uh, but it's it, it's continuing to uh, both production and use is continuing to grow at a very steady clip. Uh, Finally, we're really entering what I think is this new phase up up until the beginning of this year. Uh, other feedstocks, non-vegetable oil feedstocks really dominated the renewable diesel market uh, because they had a very low uh, carbon footprint and were somewhat out of position. We had a lot of that production taking place in the U.S. Gulf, uh, where biodiesel production, vegetable oil is produced primarily in the Midwest or, or Plain States. And so that went into those biodiesel refineries, which are also located in the Midwest. Uh, just digging in a little bit, talking about the, the trucking recession or freight recession. Uh, there's a chart here from uh, St. Louis Fed. Uh, you see these occasionally from us. Uh, they have a, a little service that makes figures on a variety of, of time series. This is data from U.S. Bureau of Transportation Statistics, essentially uh, NAS for, for the DOT uh, at the federal level. Uh, to note here, again, they use an index because it's it's not necessarily just tons moved or, or cubes moved or or gas sales. So they have a, a formula for their index. But if we look at it, basically looking at this summer, so we look in the kind of the lower right-hand side, we see that dip this summer. And then especially if you go back uh, into last year, you can see how much lower it is. And again, that is this, this recession that we've, eventually, we've been experiencing. Or, or that's a term we've been using for it. And it's important because as that has happened, we've seen a decline in diesel use uh, that, it, to, to a small degree, but it's important to keep that in mind as we look at the, some of the numbers I'll show you in a second. Uh, we did just get the new numbers from California. So now we have their uh, data through the end of the second quarter. So the you know to uh, June 30th. And kind of a longer figure, you know, going back to 2016 for this, we passed, uh, we had renewable diesel exceeded diesel sales in California in the first quarter of this year. And the adoption, that slope of that line is actually increasing, increased during the, the second quarter. Oh, so we're kind of continuing that streak. And if you can see biodiesel for quite some time has, has been a, a smaller part of this, this market, again, because the blend issues, the, the the logistics issues of of managing that really weren't as appealing, and renewable diesel in many respects is hitting this sweet spot, uh, being a low carbon fuel and working well with the existing petroleum uh, distribution system. Uh, so there's a lot on this table. A um, couple things to get a, to point out. Uh, we have some negatives. Uh, we have some positives. Actually, starting the lower right hand side in California, looking at uh, this last quarter supposed to be second quarter of 23 compared to 22. Uh, the it, combined use of diesel 
biodiesel, renewable diesel was actually down uh, by 5%. So that's a significant uh, amount. If we go to the far side, to the left, staying in that, that change over the last year, you can see that that diesel use in California is down by more than a third. Um, so those months, uh, April, May, June, from 2022 to 2023, there was a dramatic reduction in diesel use. For the most part, um, offset by renewable diesel. But again, the, the actual total amount of diesel used uh, was down significantly. We're expecting this to, to recover again, going back to that trucking recession issue. Uh, these charts just kind of, excuse, these pie charts kind of give you an idea of the size of the market share that renewable diesel has going from just over a third second quarter last year to more than half uh, for the, the second quarter of this year. You know, biodiesel is kind of holding its own. This is clearly coming at the expense of diesel, which has that, that larger carbon footprint. Digging a little bit deeper, I, I don't have the label on this. This is from uh, EIA, uh, US DOE's. Um, information service and it's it's data that they they've been reporting monthly since the beginning of last year that shows vegetable oil use uh for biofuel particularly interested in diesel uh production so if we look first we can see that that big green line so soybean oil absolutely dominates in terms of vegetable oil use complementing the non-vegetable oil feedstocks which are tallow grease and the like uh, but soybean for, for both of these, so again, this would include the biomass-based diesel is both renewable diesel and biodiesel. Soybean oil still rules, oh, and it should be corn oil for the blue, uh, and then and then canola for the for the red there. Um, but anyways, really dominates those other oils. And if we split that soybean oil into biodiesel and renewable diesel, which is the 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 solid uh, parts of the chart, you can see that biodiesel for for soybean oil is actually held steady which is interesting because we have added all of this renewable diesel production. Um, but that's really kind of the, the case that we were expecting and continue to expect where biodiesel production is going to maintain where it has been and new growth will be on, on the renewable diesel side. Uh, just looking a little bit at what feedstocks were used in California only uh, for the quarter, biodiesel is interesting because I look at this and what it is, is kind of a mess. So, I mean, we ne don't have a dominating uh, feedstock. And it's interesting in California, soybean oil is, has typically not been uh, used hardly at all to produce biodiesel that's used in the state. Again, they're looking for uh, low carbon low carbon feedstocks. And so use cooking oil and tallow are more highly valued in California, which explains some of that dominance. Now, if we go to renewable diesel, there's a couple couple things to take from this. I'd actually start looking at that soybean oil line. So it's that, that yellowish orange line. If we go back two years, it really wasn't used for renewable diesel. You know, that market was dominated by uh, all of these alternative oils uh, and and and, <clears throat> and corn oil to some extent, uh, because that is a, you know, it's a, a co-product from uh, ethanol production. And then we see, you know, more recently kind of a pickup in used cooking oil against small uh, small carbon footprint, high demand. We have soybean oil kind of maturing. And we've really hit this point, if we really look over the last three quarters, where this tremendous growth uh, is coming from. And again, we've essentially tapped out the non-vegetable oil feedstocks. I, I really don't know where this used cooking oil has come from. Wink, wink, China, it might not be used cooking oil. Uh, but going forward, we're now in this place where, and tallow too is, is essentially tapped out. We had a slight build out, but now it really is looking at the major oil seeds. So, so corn and canola, especially to, to fill that role. And we're basically in this beginning of a continual kind of steady, if not even more dramatic increase in soy, soybean oil use. And again, this is one of the reasons why we're seeing all the new crush plants here. Uh, in the upper Midwest, all of this interest, uh, you know, proposed crushed canola plants in Canada to to help fill this this growing demand. And again, if you remember, uh, two months ago, I talked about uh, California adjusting their expectations for or adjusting their their targeted mandate for low carbon fuel. So there's a much bigger market even now expected than there was, you know, earlier this summer. 
we're just at this point where all of this vegetable oil is coming online is going to go into these renewable diesel refineries uh, and have that 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 actual true physical movement uh, vegetable oil that we've been looking forward to for a few years. So those were my comments. Uh, with that, we'll take uh, questions. You can use the chat tool or the Q&A tool to do that. Uh, we already do have some, so we'll field those. But if any come to mind as we're responding, feel free to, to add your own question. Uh, we will uh, be back last month, or last month, we'll be back next month for the for the last uh, webinar of the year. But with that, we'll open up the question docket. And it's too bad Brian isn't here, but our first question is about the uh, record land sales in Pembina County. So there was uh, in the news in the last week, uh, information about a uh, land sale in Pembina County, which was $17,500 an acre. Well, uh, uh, and I I looked I looked up the the David I looked up the report yeah. on Red River Farm Network news. They they said there were two quarters sold. One of them was at uh, just over nineteen thousand dollars per planted acre, and the other was eighteen thousand seven hundred per dollars per planted acre. So a little higher numbers that we saw on the national stage, and it definitely got national attention as well as local attention. Obviously, yeah, it seems high. Yeah, um, I guess I'll make a, a couple comments on that. I, you know, again, I wish Brian was here to be able to field it. Um, I, I guess a couple observations. Uh, uh, first, for that kind of investment, uh, whoever purchased that is obviously looking at it in, in a very long term planning horizon. At least I hope they are. Um, the other, so it, it's not one of those buy it and flip it quick. <laughs> I, I just don't anticipate land prices continuing to go at this rate. Um, the other, uh, obviously, other portion of that is is the financing and the cash flow part of it. You know, there's uh, there's going to need to be some borrowed capital involved in that purchase, but there's going to need to be a, a very significant uh, cash down payment as well. Um, and because it is Pembina County, I do believe, and I don't know the parties involved, I don't know any of the background or history or story behind the land or the property itself. But if I were to to guess, I also think some of that is driven or will be driven by expected uh, very large uh, sugar beet payments this year. Because uh, as we've as we've seen over the years, uh, the, the sugar beet acreage has shifted more north. So the Northern Valley has a much higher concentration of sugar beet production than the Southern Valley. There's obviously things going on throughout the whole Valley region, but a lot of that soybean acreage has been pushed north by competition from corn and also some disease problems. So um, I, I think there was a, a combination of High, high competition. There's obviously a few people that thought it was exceptionally valuable land. Uh, the fact that they were sitting on probably some really good cash flow, they were able to make a large down payment. And I think the expectation that this is going to be a very long-term investment. That would be my take on it. Thanks, Brian. Any other comments? We did have some discussion internally uh, when the, the story came out. and You know, Frame summarized a lot of that. But again, someone for some reason, you know, found a you know justification for making the purchase and and Brian it's unfortunate again that he's not here because he he did a nice analysis in terms of of the the cost to actually finance a, a property like this or a purchase like this or the returns that you need from it it's it's really uh, it, it's really surprising it's a, it's a very high number that I don't think many of us were necessarily expecting. But I'm sure every landowner is just saying, hey, let, let this be the new thing. That, that's a great price if you've if you got it. Uh, the next question, and I'll, I'll throw this over to Frayne as well, uh, with increased soybean crush coming online in the United States, should we be concerned about slower whole bean exports and the size of the Brazilian crop? Um, yes and no. So that's a, it's kind of a mixed answer. So the the... We have to think about relative size and and rate of growth or rate of change. Um, so, hey, Dave, could could you just stop sharing for a second? I I did oh, pull up a one one slide that I think will help tell the story fairly quickly here. Yep, at least yours. on the at, yeah, I'm gonna hang on. I got to share here, share. So now this is from the October WASD, not the November one. So there'd be some subtle, small adjustments, but the blue line on top is the amount of, this is USDA forecast now, the amount of soybeans going into the crush sector. The red line is the amount of soybeans going to the export market. 
And the little dots on the far right hand side represent the current forecast for the crop that's being harvested right now. So you can see, yes, there's been a nice steady growth rate in the blue line, which is the crush demand, ability to be able to crush soybeans into oil and meal. And obviously Dave just talked about the demand, growing demand now for renewable fuels and the, and the soybean oil going into that product. But look at the growth rate. So the growth rate in crushing capacity, because it takes a while to either take an existing facility and expand it or to build, build a brand new facility. And so again, on the margin, what is the growth rate of our crush capacity? And that's been a nice steady growth. And I do expect that to increase the rate of change to increase. So we've, we're going to see a higher growth rate in that blue number, but also notice the rapid drop-off that we've had on the export side. Now, last year, uh, so about two years ago, three years ago now, we had our record soybean export year. So the last couple of years, seeing a retracement or kind of a slippage fall back on those numbers was not surprising. I guess I, you know, it's very hard to have record years over year, year after year after year. However, now, as we look at the drop off or additional reduction that we're looking at the exports, again, because of the competition we're getting from Brazil and the fact that the demand base out of China is starting to kind of flatten out where we're not seeing the rapid growth or expansion of the Chinese demand base, it's still growing, but at a much, much slower rate. You know, the combination of those two, increased supply, demand is, is starting to stabilize. And all of a sudden now this global market for soybeans, for whole soybeans get to be very, very competitive. And so I, a little bit of my concern now moving forward, if Brazil has another record crop and actually busts the, the top off the old record, what does that mean for the U.S.'s ability to stay competitive? And, and yes, we're seeing a growth in the crush capacity, but the reduction in, in exports is actually far greater than the growth in crush. So um, I guess they, I hope that answered the question. I hope I was clear. Um, so yes, I, there's still a, a, a very strong need to watch what's happening in South America. Great, thanks. Uh, and there don't appear to be any more questions. So with that, I'd like to thank the other presenters as well as all the attendees for joining us today. And we will be back next month, December 14th for the last webinar of the year. Thanks. Mm -hmm.